In this video, uh, we're going to take a closer look at probabilistic generative models. So we're going to take a closer look at what these models look like, how to work with them. Uh, but also, I'm also going to explain a bit how we can parameterize these type of um, probabilistic models. And of course, we're going to do this again via Gaussian distributions. So in this probabilistic setting, what we want to recover are the class conditional densities. So uh, meaning what is the probability of observing a given X given uh, that I know my, my class uh, CK. But I also want to recover the, pr the prior class probabilities, right? So P C K. So the probability of observing uh, one of the classes. Because then uh, together this gives me access to the joint probability distribution obtained by the product rule. So the probability of X and C K is given by the product of my class conditional probability times the prior for the class C K. And then of course also uh, these two, the sort of class conditional and the prior give us a direct access to uh, the posterior distribution via base rule, right? Um, so the posterior distribution is the most important thing when we make classifications, uh, make decisions, because it gives us uh, the probability for a given class given my uh, observation X, right? So these are the posterior distribution for the class given my observation X. And it's obtained via base rule as the product of my class conditional densities times the prior and then normalized uh, with P of X. So this thing is actually P of X, right? So because we only have two classes, uh, my marginalization over my joint probability uh, distribution is really a summing over these two classes. So uh, class one plus uh, the joint uh, with of class two evaluated. Okay, and what I'm going to do next, I'm going to rewrite this form for the posterior uh, distribution in such a way uh, that it becomes a bit more convenient for us to work with later on and to do our computations. And I'm going to specifically focus on the ratio between these joint uh, probabilities uh, for these classes. So what I could do, I could divide everything via the numerator, right? So this was the joint uh, evaluated at a C1 and I'm going to divide it. So that gives me one here, a one here and here this, this ratio. So let me do that. So that gives me, okay. So I divided everything uh, with the numerator and that gives me this uh, fraction over here. And I'm now going to make it a little bit more convenient for myself. I'm going to write this as one over one plus the exponential of minus a. And then this uh, a is, going to defined, be defined in the following way. So it has to be defined then in the following way as the log of the ratio of uh, the, the joint with C1 versus the joint with uh, C2. Okay, so, um, well, you, you can already see or you can immediately verify that um, if my A is defined in this way, then, well, I take the exponential of this log and it gives me this thing. So really I, what I did, I was rewriting this thing as such that I could formulate it in terms of what we call the log odds. And this particular function will be called the logit function. And I will discuss this, this particular function. So this uh, logit function in more detail and in the upcoming slides. Okay, so uh, this thing over here will be called the log odds. Okay, and I rewrote it in such a way um, for several reasons, uh, because now if you want to make decisions, then we can purely focus on this, this log odds uh, component over here, because when we have computed this thing, then we can directly uh, compute also the posterior uh, probability. And this is convenient to work with because now we formulate it in terms of a logarithm and we've seen plenty of times already now that this is a useful thing to do, especially when we're going to model these probabilities uh, in terms of um, uh, Gaussian uh, distributions. And that's what actually what we're going to uh, do later on. Okay, so let's, let's take a closer look at this particular function, right? So this function uh, allowed us to write the posterior class probabilities in the following form where the sigma is given below of some a and a were uh, the log odds. So that's, that's where this function comes into play. And it's given as follows and it looks like this. 
Um, and it has some nice properties. Uh, first of all, we see that uh, it's always bounded between zero and one. Uh, so it's nice and that corresponds nicely also with a probabilistic interpretation um, where the probability of observing this particular class uh, cannot be larger than one. Now it also has this nice behavior that if my odds, and that's actually given on this horizontal, horizontal axis, when this odds go to infinity, then really uh, my uh, probability uh, is converging to one and in the other word direction is converging to zero. So that means that if my log odds, so the ratio between these probabilities is really in favor of uh, the class one, um, so then this ratio becomes very large and that actually means that my probability will saturate to uh, the probability one. And when the log odds is zero, so remember I take the log of this ratio, meaning that suppose these probabilities are equal, then this ratio is one and the log of one gives me zero. So really at uh, the log odds of zero, I'm going to obtain a probability of 0 0.5. Okay, so that's also a nice uh, property that indeed if I do not have any information, then, uh, well, the probability is equally likely for uh, both classes. Then there's two other convenient properties that I want to mention, and that is that the reflection of this thing. So if I take uh, the logistic sigmoid of minus a, then I just get this mirror thing, and that can be obtained via one minus uh, the logistic sigmoid. And it also has a nice derivative. Uh, so the derivative of this logistic sigmoid is again uh, some combination of the logistic sigmoid uh, uh, with itself. And this is going to be useful in many of the, the, the chain rules that, that also you will apply throughout this course. And so, well, we already did this a lot, right? Uh, computing derivatives to find optimal uh, values for my parameters. We're going to do that more often. And when we work with logistic sigmoids, we can actually re nicely rely on, on this rule. Now we can do the same uh, for general K. If we have multiple classes, we just consider the two class uh, problem. Uh, but if we have K classes, then we have K of these uh, posterior uh, distributions, uh, one for each K. And each of them is also given via the base rule. And uh, so we have the class conditional densities times the prior and then normalized it at P of X, right? So this was uh, P of X and that's the marginalization over all my classes. And I only have a discrete set of classes. So this is really the sum. And now also here we can rewrite this in the following form. Uh, we do it as follows. So we take the exponential of A K divided by the sum J is one to capital K the exponential of the AJs, where each AK is going to be defined as the log of this uh, joint probability of X with that particular uh, class CK. Now, in this case, these AKs are not uh, defined as this, this ratio. Uh, we leave it in this form for now, but if we consider the class the case two case, we could rewrite it in, in, in this form, uh, where we end up with what we saw the log odds in the, in the binary case. But that's not what we're going to do in the general uh, setting for with K classes. We're going to define these AKs uh, per class CK. Now this function over here is called the softmax function. And it's called this way because it, it takes the, the sort of the maximum over all these Ks in a soft way. Uh, meaning that suppose my AK is much larger than all of these uh, other uh, classes. Um, then we actually obtain that the posterior class probability CK, which is derived then via the softmax function, uh, will be close to one. And for all the other CJs, it will be close to zero. So it really singles out the K class. And that's why it's called the softmax uh, function. Okay, and I also just mentioned that for the KS2 case, we could rewrite the softmax function to uh, the logistic sigmoid. By, well, we have these two classes, so I can divide again by the numerator. We have this particular form, and this then gives us the sigma of A, and so the logistic sigmoid of A, where A is defined as A1 minus A2. Um, we can write it in such a way because we're talking about the log of these uh, probabilities, right? And then uh, taking uh, subtracting logarithms means that I could also take the fraction inside this uh, logarithm.
Okay, so the soft max function reduces to the logistic sigmoid function in the case where I'm only considering two classes. Okay, so my posterior distributions will uh, in the end be um, described via these logistic sigmoids or uh, these soft max functions. Uh, but still, I haven't explained how are we going to actually parameterize or a uh, class conditional densities. Uh, right, because that's what we actually wanted to recover, these two components, the class conditionals and the priors. So we need to pa parameterize this in some form and then going to tune the parameters um, well, to retrieve these distributions. Now, in this course, we will again primarily focus on the, the normal distributions, the Gaussian distributions, though in the next video, I will also consider a, different, a slightly different uh, parameterization of uh, the class conditionals. But for now, let's focus on the Gaussian distributions, which means that my class conditionals, so suppose I'm given the class, what are the, uh, the, the probabilities of observing a particular x that will be described via a Gaussian. Right, so my Gaussian is now d-dimensional, where d corresponds to the dimension of my um, input. Uh, so my Gaussian is a multivariate d-dimensional Gaussian. Now, such a multivariate Gaussian uh, is, in the general case, um, parameterized via these means. So uh, the Gaussian is centered around some location in Rd, and it has some covariance matrix, uh, sigma k, uh, associated with it. And the sigma k really determines the shape of uh, my Gaussian distribution. Okay, and then in this modeling, uh, this means that for each class k, so for each k, I have one uh, mean and I have one covariance matrix. Though we're now going to make it easy for ourselves, and we're going to say that all my classes share the same covariance matrix. And we will see that this eventually leads to the framework of linear discriminant analysis. Often referred to as LDA. Okay, that's the point I'm going to make next. So if we assume that uh, each of these Gaussians uh, share the same covariance matrix, I end up with what we call linear discriminant analysis. So let's first focus on uh, the case of two classes. So what does my problem look like if I consider only two classes? Uh, we already just saw that then my posterior distribution is given simply by taking the log logistic sigmoid of my log odds. So the logarithm of the ratio between these two uh, probabilities. Now, if my probabilities, so my class conditional probabilities are parameterized uh, well, via normal distributions, we take the log of a ratio, this, so this becomes the log, uh, sorry, the, the sum of uh, the log of the first uh, distribution minus the log of the second uh, Gaussian distribution plus uh, this, this ratio, which we leave as it is for the moment. Uh, we're going to focus on these um, class conditional densities. Okay, so I just used the rules for uh, logarithms to split this into three terms, and I'm now going to focus on the logarithms of my um, class conditional densities. And so if we write this out, so we're really we're computing the log odds, we're writing out the log odds, that gives me this full expression over here. So each Gaussian distribution had a front factor and it has this exponential of this quadratic form, right? And if I take the logarithm of this exponential, that gives me this uh, the thing that was in, in this exponent, so this quadratic form. And I have the same for my uh, second Gaussian, this front factor and what was inside, well, over here, what was inside uh, the, the exponent. And then we have the priors, uh, which we leave for, uh, leave for what, what, what they are at the moment. So what I'm going to show next is that these log odds really, uh, given in the following way, really uh, are linear functions of x. Uh, and I'm going to show that as follows. So we have these front factors. Uh, which cancel out, right? So I subtract the log of these Gaussians and these front factors are the same. So, okay, th those can be ignored. Um, but we also see that uh, these terms, so x times the inverse covariance x, show up uh, in both places. So uh, th also these will be canceled out. And now I'm just going to collect uh, the terms, uh, right? So we have uh, minus minus, so we have mu1 minus mu2 times what's on the other side. So that, that, let me just write it out. So that gives me 
mu1 minus mu2 transpose inverse covariance x uh, minus a half mu1 transpose covariance inverse mu1 plus a half mu2 transpose covariance inverse mu2 plus this uh, logarithm term uh, the ratio between uh, the priors so that really shows that in this ks2 case with a shared covariance matrix these log odds are really a linear function of x so that means i can really write my posterior uh, class probabilities in the following way where i'm just evaluating this linear function this linear mapping from x to some a uh, and I'm going to pull this through the logistic sigmoid where we've defined these uh, w's in the following way so that's this part that's the w part and this is w0 so that's like a, a bias uh, term and so that really gives me a, ge a generalized linear model right so we have a, a linear function over here and I'm going to so it's not fully linear because in the end I'm going to pull this through a, a particular activation function um, given by the logistic sigmoid and that turns this uh, thing into a probability. Okay now this really means that if I'm going to make decisions based on these posterior distributions so I'm going to compare the posterior distribution for class 1 given my observation x versus the pro posterior uh, for class 2 given x so I'm going to make this comparison and I said the decision boundary is going to be at the location where these uh, two probabilities are equal uh, since the sigmoid is a monotonic function, I can only also just focus on uh, this log odds. So in the end, um, I'm going to make my decisions on the regions where a1 equals a2. So my decision boundary, my decision boundary is in the end given by uh, this uh, linear form. So that explains why we are dealing with a linear decision boundary and therefore we call this linear discriminant analysis. Actually, I said that we're working with uh, two classes. So um, the decision boundary really takes place at the point where A equals uh, zero or equivalently where the sigma of A equals a half. Okay, so now let's take a look at an example what, what this actually looks like, right? So um, what I'm showing over here are uh, the class conditional densities for, um, well, for the different classes, right? So the class conditional densities means, suppose I am consider class 1, for example the red class, then the probabilities of observing a particular x, um, well, is given by this uh, distribution. So I have two of such um, class conditional densities, uh, red and blue shown over here and then if I'm going to evaluate uh, my posterior um, distribution so my posterior probability for class 1 so that's indicated over here uh, that will have this logistic shape so we have this nice decision boundary at the point where this probability is a half so this is the decision boundary And the decision boundary is a linear as we just saw and the decision boundary is actually located at the place where the posterior so p of cl for class one i'm considering uh, the binary case so i can only focus i can just focus on class one so the posterior for class one um, which is given by the sigma of a equals a half right and this put this posterior was obtained by evaluating or checking the uh, class conditionals uh, for C2 and C1. Okay, great. So we saw that if we model uh, the, the class conditionals with Gaussians, then we end up with a posterior distribution, uh, which uh, gives us uh, this linear decision boundary in the end. Now we can also do this for general K. Um, so again, we're going to model each uh, class conditional density uh, via a Gaussian and we're also again going to say that each Gaussian shares the same covariance matrix because then we end up with linear decision boundaries uh, but each Gaussian still has a parameter mu which we want to optimize. Now we saw that these posterior distributions were given uh, via the softmax function um, so the softmax function uh, given my uh, a case 
and each ak can also in this case be written as a linear function of x where using a similar derivation as we just saw before for the ks2 case my wk will now be my inverse covariance with the mean for that uh, class and it has a bias given by minus uh, a half mu k inverse covariance mu k plus the log of the prior. So we see this is very similar as what we just saw before, but um, as mentioned before, now I'm considering these individual AKs, so no longer the ratios between probabilities, and that simplifies uh, these expressions uh, quite a bit actually. Uh, maybe that's a good exercise if you want to, to verify this, um, but I'm sure that you'll believe me on this. <laughs> okay. Um, so decision theory then tells us that my optimal decision boundaries are at the locations where these posterior class probabilities are equal. And that eventually means that my uh, decision boundaries in this uh, linear discriminant analysis case uh, means that um, my AKs, which are a function of X, have to be equal, right? And because each of these AKs were uh, linear in X, this means I'll, I will end up with linear decision boundaries. I'll give an example in the, in the next slide. Uh, but finally, finally a remark, um, we could actually decide to work with different covariance matrices. Um, then every AK will also contain a quadratic uh, term in X. And this will then lead to a quadratic decision boundaries. So maybe that's nicely shown here in this example. So what we consider here, we consider three classes and each class has, has, it, has its own conditional density. Um, and we're going to now model like two of the classes. We're going to give them the same covariance matrix. And then there's a, a third class which has its own uh, covariance matrix. Then if we look at the decision boundaries, so where uh, these probabilities are the same, um, this leads actually in this region to a linear uh, decision boundary and because of the quadratic term in this one it will lead to a quadratic de decision boundary over here and here so we have a linear decision boundary over here because the covariance matrices are the same and a quadratic boundary in these regions because well this this one has a different uh, covariance matrix Okay, so this is beautiful, right? So we end up with these linear and quadratic uh, decision boundaries, uh, which is simple enough, right? And, and so we came to this point by saying that we're going to model the class conditional densities uh, with Gaussian distributions. Then when we say that these Gaussian distributions share the same covariance matrix, we end up with linear uh, decision boundaries. And we made that observation uh, primarily due to the fact that we opposed here distributions were defined uh, via logistic sigmoids or via softmax functions. And these softmax functions, they really take as input these logits, these AKs, which were linear functions uh, of X. And that tells us that actually our decision boundaries are also going to be linear. Now in the next video, I'm going to show how we can actually derive uh, these uh, sigmas and uh, the locations of these Gaussians via a maximum likelihood principle.